Judson University. Well, welcome, folks. My name is Paul Croce. I teach here at Stetson in History and American Studies. I'm really delighted to be introducing Chris Gebhardt, who was only recently here in your seats and now has moved on to all kinds of interesting and exciting things, some of which he's going to speak about tonight. And you know, <coughs> those of us who teach in the liberal arts <coughs> are fond of encouraging uh, uh, our students not just to learn about the materials we teach about, and the skills that we can teach about, but also to think about how those interests can serve as pools of resources for future work. <clears throat> After all, if you're doing things you're interested in, you'll probably do a good job in them, and it serves as a, as a possibility for thinking about directions, for getting aim for where you're going. And you can put in a, a pin in the map of your future, of your own future, and say, I want to go there. Well, Chris Gebhardt exhibits those qualities tremendously um, and in really creative ways. He was not only an outstanding student with a double major in English and American Studies, um, but he, he, was, um, he also had, an, right from the start, a real passion, real interest in, in space and in NASA. And he kept those, those, those ideas, those interests percolating all through his years at Stetson. He integrated a lot of these interests right into his coursework, and um, he's now taking these ideas into the work that he's doing now. His, um, the, the things he learned at Stetson about writing and about, about culture, he's now applying as a tutor, and a professional tutor at the Writing Center at Daytona College, and he also works as the Kennedy Space Center correspondent and story editor at nasaspaceflight.com. So Chris, the trajectory of your career has been a real inspiration and we really look forward to hearing you tonight and for years to come. I look forward to sharing it. <laughs> Great. Um, as Dr. Croce said, uh, my name is Chris Gebhardt. I was a student here at Stetson from 2006 to May of 2010 and during most of that time I began working down at the Kennedy Space Center as a reporter covering the final 15 missions of the Space Shuttle program. Um, what Dr. Croce said about space being a huge part of who I am, uh, there's probably not a truer statement to that. Um, I was born and raised here in Daytona Beach and the space program, and particularly the Space Shuttle program, was always a huge part of my life and my family's life. So being able to be there and experience those final few missions of it was, was truly an honor and a privilege. And we, we're in an interesting time now with NASA. Um, the program that most of us have only known, if we're young enough, born after 1981, um, but certainly the program that's been around the longest of, of any of the world's space programs, the Space Shuttle, ended in July of this year. And when it ended, quite unfortunately, there was nothing yet to replace it when the final mission was flown. But a lot of things have been happening in the last few months, and we have a system to succeed the space shuttle, not, not replace it, but succeed it. And we've got some pretty exciting things that NASA is hoping to do and hoping to accomplish in the next few decades. So in the period that we're in now, we could say in many ways that NASA is going through a period of redefinition for itself. The space industry is no longer one just for government entities, as we're seeing with a lot of the Burgoyne and commercial companies out there like Boeing and Lockheed Martin, but also SpaceX and Orbital, nature of the game is changing, and NASA is changing with it. And with it comes what they're referring to as the 21st century vision for space exploration, which is part of what I'm going to share with you tonight. But in order to understand the redefinition of what NASA is going through right now, we first have to understand what's defined us up until now. And to begin with, it was really all about beating the Soviets. Um, at the end of World War II, many of the German rocket scientists, including Werner von Braun, escaped the Nazi rule over in Germany. And the United States and the Soviet Union were very interested in acquiring those scientists. And very luckily for the United States and for NASA, we got Werner von Braun, who is the father of modern rocketry, as we say, and certainly the father and the, des the designer 
of the Apollo Saturn V launch vehicle, which took mankind to the moon in the 1960s and 1970s. But aside from that, there was also the initiation of the space race and what we hear about in the 1950s and 1960s and what was really the drive of NASA in its creation. But aside from putting men into space and aside from putting men into the moon, there was also the race to get satellites into orbit. And not just Sputnik and the Explorer 1 satellites from the Soviet Union and from the United States, which just went up and circled the Earth and gave a little ping to tell us that they were there, but to also put into space and Earth orbit weather satellites to help us improve our own understanding of planet Earth. And really that was a very fundamental part of the space age in its beginning. It wasn't just to put men into space, it was to help us understand the planet that we live on from a vantage point that we had never seen before. It also marked the start of a lot of our planetary robotic missions, including the Mariner missions, the Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 probes, which are still sailing out of our solar system and still in operation today some 34 years after they were launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. And especially this little guy right here, um, who, the Viking 1 spacecraft, which was the first successful spacecraft to land on the planet Mars and actually perform its mission. In the early 1970s, it lasted for six years on the planet Mars, which was a record that stood until March of 2010 when, and apparently I'm not talking loud enough, which for those of you who know me is kind of hard to believe. Uh, <laughs> um, the, the, Mar uh, the, the Viking 1 mission lasted for six years on Mars, which was a record that stood until March of 2010 when the little Mars exploration rover Spirit finally surpassed it. So, but ultimately, that's not a lot of what we remember as a culture. What we remember as a culture is this, the drive to get us to the moon. It was in many ways what we refer to and what we call the space race. Who could get there first, the United States or the Soviet Union? And one of the things that NASA did to its advantage that the Soviet Union did not is we took a very phased approach to how we decided to get to the moon. We didn't decide just to build the Apollo Saturn V rocket and try to launch it on its very first attempt and get there. We started with Project Mercury, a little one-man capsule that for the first two flights of which were suborbital, just shot um, Gus Grissom and Alan Shepard right out of Cape Canaveral and they splashed down a few hundred miles in the Atlantic Ocean away. Um, and then the five orbital missions of the Mercury program. And all the Mercury program was really designed to do was to let us get acquainted with that aspect of launching rockets and launching people into space. There really wasn't anything that happened during the Mercury missions. The Mercury missions didn't dock to anything. They didn't rendezvous with anything. There were no spacewalks during this program. It really, really was about just getting started and proving that A, we could survive in space, which no one knew, um, if we really could until the first manned space flights. But also, again, to prove that we could do it and that we had the technological capability to do so. But as that project was going on, simultaneously came the development of Project Gemini, which saw the increase of our astronaut size, or our, the number of astronauts we launched into space at one time to two. And in Project Gemini, we expanded upon the knowledge that we gained from Project Mercury but also took it a step further. We practiced our ability to rendezvous with spacecraft in Earth orbit, which we knew we were gonna have to do if we wanted to go to the moon. We practiced our spacewalks and actually leaving the spacecraft for the very first time, which again, we would have to do if we wanted to go to the moon and we wanted to do lunar spacewalks. And like Project Mercury, at the same time that Project Gemini was, a, was going on, development for Project Apollo was well underway. It was just actually. It was um, just after um, the first um, the first suborbital manned flight in 1961 for the United States that President Kennedy gave the directive to Congress and to the nation that he wanted us to go to the moon and land on the moon safely and return people from the moon before that decade was out. And ultimately, Project Apollo began when we were still flying Project Mercury at this time. And through this phased approach, by the time we got to Project Apollo. We had the rocket architecture. We had the lunar architecture to get us to the moon, and we had already practiced all of the things that we would need to do once we got there. But again, just like the other programs, we didn't build the Saturn V and launch it on the very first Apollo missions. Some of the very first Apollo missions were with rockets that weren't the giant moon rocket of the Saturn V. 
And when we actually launched the Saturn V for the very first time, we didn't put people on it. We launched it completely unmanned just to prove that the rocket could actually do what we wanted it to do. And again, like we talked about with the phased approach to everything, we practiced rendezvousing with the lunar module that would eventually take us to the surface of the moon. And we practiced that in Earth orbit and in moon orbit, in lunar orbit, before we ever attempted to actually land a man on the moon. We sent our astronauts on the Apollo 8 mission in late December of 1968 to the moon just to enter orbit of the moon and circle it again to prove that we could do that before setting our sights on the very ambitious Apollo 11 mission. And through that phased approach, by the time we got to the Apollo 11 mission in July of 1969, we had all the pieces in place. Certainly, there were uncertainties, as always comes with launching rockets and putting men into space, but the groundwork had been laid. And we knew exactly what we had to do and when we had to do it to actually achieve that goal. And we did it on Apollo 11. And we did it again on Apollo 12 and 14 and 15 and 16 and 17. Again, all because of the groundwork that was laid in those early Mercury and Gemini program flights. But ultimately, nothing quite lasts forever. Um, and after the final Apollo 17 flight to the moon in 1972, what we had was what I would argue the first redefinition in NASA's history. For so long, NASA had been tasked with landing a man on the moon and returning them safely to Earth. And then we did it successfully, five to six times. Yeah, I'm bad at math, by the way. And I talk about NASA and math all the time. Uh, <laughs> so after that, we, we had a period of redefinition. The Apollo program was costing us too much. And quite frankly, there was a lack of public interest that, that fell sharply after the Apollo 11 mission. We had accomplished the goal. We had landed a man on the moon. And the public sort of got into a lackadaisical mindset about the science that was actually going on during these lunar missions. And what happened was the cancellation of the final three planned moon landings on Apollo is 18, 19, and 20. And what we had was a refocus from the moon back to our home planet and into low Earth orbit. And specifically, what we did first with that was the Skylab space station. The, the Soviet Union had already launched a space station into orbit called the Salyut space station and were operating it around the same time. But the United States had never operated in space for more than the 14 days that it took to reach the moon, do the mission, and come back to Earth. So one of the things that we wanted to prove to ourselves before committing to other missions was that we could live in space for prolonged periods of time. And what we got from this was the Skylab program, which saw three manned missions to that space station. The first one lasting for 30 days, the second one lasting for 60 days, and the third, one, third and final one lasting for 90 days. So again, a very phased approach to proving exactly what we could do and the tolerance of the human body in a non-gravity environment. And of course, we developed here on Earth. We're used to gravity. We depend on it. And a lot of the physiological signs and symptoms that happen to our body without gravity, we didn't know because we hadn't spent enough time in space to really understand those. And the Skylab project was really our first attempt and NASA's first attempt to understand what happens to the human body in a microgravity environment. And, but again, like all things, Skylab didn't last forever. And by the middle of the 1970s, we didn't want to operate the Skylab space station anymore. And what we got was one final flight for the Apollo program called the Apollo Soyuz Test Program, which actually practiced the rendezvous and docking of two manned spacecraft in orbit. And it was the first time that two manned spacecraft actually, do actually docked together in Earth orbit. And it wasn't a docking between two American spacecraft. It was actually a docking between an Apollo spacecraft and the Russian Soyuz spacecraft. And it was really a, and truly a symbolic end to the space race, which had begun in the 1950s. And kind of the beginning of, our two, of the two nations beginning to work together in space toward a common goal. But by the time 1975 rolled around and we did the Apollo-Soyuz test program, the most iconic rocket in the world, the one that you can go to pretty much any country and show them a picture of it, and they can tell you that that's the space shuttle, 
was well on its way to development. By the time Project Apollo ended the, and, and the last moon landing occurred, we knew generally what the space shuttle was going to look like. We knew what its capabilities were going to be. Congress had approved it, and construction of the first prototype shuttle enterprise was already underway out in California. So again, even though Apollo, to many people, was very sad to let go of, and that dream of continuing a, man a manned presence on the moon was going away, we knew exactly what was coming next, and we knew the capabilities of this rocket. And one of the things that the shuttle allowed us to do was stay very close to home and really build up our Earth-based systems and our satellite systems and our knowledge of living and working in space, which is exactly the knowledge uh, we're going to need when we leave Earth orbit again uh, at the end of this decade or the beginning of the next decade. Um, and, but unlike all the previous vehicles that had come before it, the shuttle was designed to be reusable. The twin solid rocket boosters flew on various missions throughout the life of the program and were completely reusable, as was the shuttle orbiter, the Columbia Challenger Discovery Atlantis and Endeavor. The only part of the system that wasn't actually used for more than one flight was the giant rust-colored external fuel tank. But by using that system in the same vehicle over and over and over again, it really allowed us to learn the intricacies of the rocket, the do's and the don'ts for how to fly it. And more importantly, it taught us to respect our space program and the rockets that we build and the people that we put in them. Um, one of the good things about flying a vehicle 135 times is you learn its quirks and you learn what to do and you learn what not to do. And one of the true amazing testaments to the shuttle program, besides the fact that it could carry up to eight people in space at a time, Apollo could only carry three, Gemini two and Mercury one, is it allowed us to build an extensive communications network in orbit, um, a network that serves all of our orbiting spacecraft today and also helps some of our communication here on Earth uh, through the tracking and data relay satellite system network. And this network, uh, which we began putting it in space on the STS-5 mission, the fifth flight of the space shuttle back in 1982, um, this network is still in existence today and actually as of 5 p.m. NASA actually just ordered another uh, TDRS satellite from the Boeing company. So it's a system that we still use to high degree today and how we communicate with our astronauts on board the International Space Station today. Shuttle also allowed us to launch several of the great space observatories of our time, the most, um, the most famous of which being the Hubble Space Telescope. But not only that, it gave us a very unique capability of being able to access what we had put in space. No longer was it a matter of just launching something into orbit and, well, if it didn't work, it didn't work. We couldn't, we couldn't do anything about it. The shuttle would allow us to go service some of these satellites that broke down in orbit, to deploy large scientific payloads into orbit for a few years, go back, retrieve them, and bring them back to Earth to see how they fared you know, during their years in space. But perhaps the biggest success story here still is the mission of the shuttle that saved the Hubble Space Telescope. It, could very well have been one of the biggest blunders that NASA had when they launched the Hubble telescope, turned it on, and realized that it was nearsighted um, due to a very small defect in one of the lenses that it uses. And a shuttle mission in late 1993 actually enabled NASA to go up and, for all intents and purposes, install eyeglasses onto the Hubble Space Telescope to correct its vision. And after that one servicing mission, we performed four other servicing missions to Hubble, continuously upgrading its systems to let us understand a lot more about our universe and the formation of our universe and our galaxies. It also let us learn how to work in a very, very confined space. One of the things, if you've ever seen a video of NASA strapping in the astronauts into the space shuttle, it looks pretty roomy on television. And let me tell you, it's not. <laughs> uh, it is a very, very cramped and confined space to the point where two people in it is hard to imagine for a 14 and 16 day mission. And the shuttle routinely flew seven to six people on board at a time. So it really let us learn a lot about how people react and how their personalities can change in low Earth orbit, which is something that we didn't expect, but actually that we learned from the shuttle. Um, it let us learn how people work together in, in a confined space when they're separated from their families um, and flying very dangerous missions. You know, as, as successful as the shuttle program was, 
especially when it was on orbit, it, it was very dangerous to be in low Earth orbit, and it still is to this day. And the shuttle really let us understand that. Um, and one of the things that doesn't get reported, much to my chagrin, um, and, and this is the fault of both the news media, I think, and, and on a large part NASA for not really releasing a lot of this information, but all the scientific research that was done on the space shuttle. You know, mo in, the, in the final days of the space shuttle program, all of the missions that we flew were more or less to the International Space Station. And what got publicized was how much the module cost, what it would actually do, you know, was it just spare parts? Was it even our module? Because the shuttle launched the European and Japanese lab components for the station as well. But what nobody really reported on was that every single space shuttle flight that flew performed biological experiments and scientific experiments on the crew and on animals to determine how they react in low Earth orbit. And it also performed Earth science missions on every single flight uh, that made it to orbit. And a lot of those Earth science missions allowed us to produce the most accurate topographical map of the Earth to date was a flight by the space shuttle, and also to really understand Earth's oceans and how the oceans interact with rivers and tributaries and how the pollutants that we put into our water and into our air circulate around the world and how that affects the atmosphere at its uppermost levels, at, at the very reaches of space. And Let's face it, how many of us sleep on a mattress at night? Everyone, I'm going to assume? OK, um, well, you can thank NASA for that. Because a huge, a huge improvement in mattress foam, and we've all heard memory foam and, and everything, and sleep number, and all of those things were things that were originally designed for the space shuttle, for the seats that the astronauts strap their se themselves into for launch. Because they sit on their backs for a good two and a half hours before liftoff on every, sing every single time. So, there are a lot of real world practical applications to the shuttle program that never got reported. But you certainly heard the price tag whenever one of them landed in California and we had to fly it back across the country. But even during the shuttle program, which is very natural for a program that was in existence for over three decades, it went through three major phases um, in, its, in its lifetime. The first major phase, the development, the developmental test flights, and the first flights that launched a lot of our telescopes and did a lot of biological and earth science dedicated missions until we got to a, from, from the early 1980s to about the mid 1990s when the, when the Soviet Union broke apart and now we were dealing with Russia and Russia had a space station up there that it had constructed during the time that it was still the, um, the Soviet Union. And around this time in, the, in 1994 was when the idea finally solidified to build what now became the International Space Station, which was based largely off an idea in the 1980s for a NASA base station called Space Station Freedom. And in building the International Space Station, we had cooperation from primarily the United States, Russia, Canada, um, Japan, and over 15 nations within the European Space Agency in, and Brazil and Australia. Um, but part of that, again, in a phased approach that NASA took, was striking a deal with the Russian Federal Space Agency to fly nine space shuttle missions to the Russian space station Mir, which would give us practice in rendezvousing with a space station in orbit, working on an international level, and finishing construction of a space station. Something that not too many people realize is that uh, the space shuttle actually brought up the final module for the Russian space station Mir and was actually the vehicle that completed construction of the Russian station. Um, and, and those nine flights were hugely instrumental um, in us learning um, how to conduct joint science operations, how to share potentially technical sensitive information between governments here on Earth in a way that was safe and didn't violate the particular laws of that nation. And kind of importantly, it also taught us how to do spacewalks around, sta around a station structure with live solar array panels that couldn't be turned off and electrocution shocks you know, around every turn. And really taught us that safety measure of, again, what it would take when we went to build the International Space Station. And I would argue, very importantly too, taught us how to live as a human family in space. You know, 
when, when American astronauts lived aboard the Russian space station, they were in constant contact with both NASA employees, but also Russian space agency officials. And that idea that countries didn't share similar interests had to vanish at a certain point for us to come together to do this. And the Shuttle Mir program really helped solidify the allied stance that the United States now has with Russia in terms of space exploration. Oh, and another cool little fact, in terms of the science missions, on one of these Shuttle Mir missions, um, because one of the things we are looking at as we move out from low Earth orbit is it's very expensive to bring all the food necessary to feed people on a prolonged mission. And one of the things that we are looking at on the International Space Station today is how to grow certain crops and vegetables in space and what the potential effects are of there, all of which started right here on, um, on the Mir Space Station when seedlings grew into small trees and produced seeds and then carried on three generations of different plants all living in, in Earth orbit, which gave us great insight into how to build the particular enclosures that we would need to, to both sustain a living plant in orbit but also get nutrients and sustenance from it. And of course, all of this led to the International Space Station, which really was the first true global partnership in endeavors in space. It marked the, the beginning of permanent human habitation in low Earth orbit, which we reached the 10th anniversary of which in late October, uh, 10 years of permanent human habitation in low Earth orbit aboard the International Space Station. But more than anything, again, it, it represents a step-by-step -step process in eventually going beyond low Earth orbit. We did not build the International Space Station just because we could, mainly because when we're going to go someplace beyond the moon, primarily to Mars, which is our big destination, it's not going to be a single spacecraft that just launches from Cape Canaveral carrying astronauts, goes there, lands, and comes back. We're going to have to build the spacecraft to take us to Mars in Earth orbit to actually accomplish this. And the International Space Station was a huge learning curve for that. It is comprised of dozens of modules that were built all around the world and at different times from one another. The earliest construction of a module began in 1994 when Russia and the United States began building the two parts that would link the Russian and US segments of the station together. And the last module, which will launch aboard a Russian proton rocket in May of next year, began construction in 2007. And amazingly, when we got it all up there, it fit. <laughs> and it was a huge accomplishment. Not, never did we get to connect two wires and that close. It, it all worked perfectly for us. But along the way, what we have learned is that the materials that we use to build the International Space Station are much more resilient than we thought they would be to the wild temperature swings that the vehicle experiences in low Earth orbit, which can go from anywhere on a lighted side pass to 200 degrees Fahrenheit to on a nighttime pass negative 150 degrees Fahrenheit in the blink of an eye. So the station really does have to take a pounding from not only thermal constraints or thermal considerations, but also from the massive debris field that we have in low Earth orbit. And the station was built to withstand a lot of those small micrometeorite and micrometeorite orbiting debris impacts. And after every single shuttle mission, one thing that we always did after we undocked the shuttle was to do a fly around of the space station, which we all like to call a victory lap. Um, but during that fly around, they took photographs, detailed high resolution photographs of the outside of the station to show us how well it was holding up over these years. And it has held up remarkably well, um, to the point that it surprised many NASA officials and that our goal on the last four flights of the space shuttle to stockpile supplies on the International Space Station that no other vehicle could take up was really a true stockpiling effort in the event that we needed them. Many of those spares were not built for those particular missions, but spares built when we first built the individual modules and truss segments, thinking that, well, this will last for five years and then we'll have to replace it. And 12 years down the road, it's still operating fine. So it really was a huge scientific learning curve in how to build a vehicle from scratch in orbit. It also helped us learn how to balance the scientific need aboard the International Space Station, which is what it was built for, um, with the human need and, and the crew need. 
you know, so, so often, you know, we, we launch our astronauts and they spend six months on orbit, and many of us don't think about what that actually entails psychologically and physically for our crew. Um, I think there are many people who think that they never get a day off <laughs> up there, that you launch and you work for six straight months, but they get Saturdays and Sundays and holidays off just like we do, um, and, and periods of rest built into their schedules to help them deal with that feeling of isolation that naturally comes. And it really also helped us understand, you know, and balance that, you know, well, if the communication relay on the station is needed by Europe to run an experiment in the Columbus lab, but you know what, he hasn't talked to his wife in two weeks, what do you think wins out in a case like that? Something that we had never actually had to consider before that, that we're learning about now. And one of the best, I think, recognitions that NASA could have gotten for this endeavor is the recognition of the International Space Station as a U.S. national laboratory, which opens it up to commercial scientific endeavors, which can be launched in little, they call them cubes. Um, and for those of you who are Star Trek fans, they do actually look like board cubes um, that just plug into slots in, in the Destiny Science Laboratory and the Columbus Science Laboratory and, and in Japan Science Laboratory that are self-contained experiments that can be done and any commercial company within the United States can apply to have one of their experiments flown to the International Space Station and the experiment done in space because of this designation. And because of this designation, a lot of government funding has opened up too for a lot of the cancer research that goes on on the International Space Station and a lot of the bacteria and virus research that goes on in the International Space Station. And Particularly from that, we'll get to this in a minute, of exactly what those are and, and what NASA is planning to do with the station in the future. But again, one of the huge learning curves that we've had since the completion of the International Space Station and the retirement of the space shuttle in July is we lost an incredible upmass ability for payload to the International Space Station. You know, in, in one single logistics flight that they called for the shuttle, the shuttle was capable of delivering somewhere around 20,000 pounds of equipment and scientific experiments to the station and bringing back 20,000 pounds of scientific equipment and experiments from the station for analysis here on Earth. The, the vehicle that best matches that now in capability can bring about 3,000 pounds of scientific equipment up to the station at a time. So we, and no vehicle currently in operation for the station can bring anything back from it successfully. All of the vehicles we have now, um, with the exception of the Russian Soyuz, which carries people, um, burns up in the atmosphere after separating from the International Space Station. So we lost a, a great deal by retiring the space shuttle, and, and it's stuff that we, we won't really ever get back, um, that capability. But with that, a lot, a lot of the large-scale spares, too, that we stockpiled on station we're designed because no other, we're, we designed that purposely because no other vehicle can bring those large external spares up to the station. And a lot of the, and, and a lot of them too, are still sitting right here on the ground because there was, just simply wasn't room on the International Space Station's exterior to store all of these items because we never envisioned building the station and then retiring its parent, basically. Um, and it, it's something we're having to deal with. The, the solar arrays of the station, which provide all of its power, and this space station is also the most green vehicle ever created. Um, for those of you in, uh, uh, really um, into the environment and environmental studies, it is 98% self-sufficient on the station. It produces its own air, it produces its own water, and it produces all of its own power. So much power, in fact, that on a few of the final shuttle missions, the shuttles actually used power from the station to stay on orbit a bit longer. Um, but it, it's, a, it's again a learning curve of what do we do if one of the solar arrays is badly damaged on the station? Well, we don't have a vehicle that can launch a new solar array to the station. So it's something that NASA is having to think about for potential issues that they'll have to deal with where we just don't have the spares on orbit because we don't have the vehicle to bring them there. But that's the depressing side of things. Uh, <laughs> there is a lot of good too, and this is really hard for me because I'm very attached to the space shuttle and it was very sad to see it go, but there, there is a lot of good 
that is going to come from the retirement of the shuttle and our ability to refocus a lot of the money that was spent on flying that system to other areas. Um, and most of that is happening right here at the Kennedy Space Center. Um, you know, at the Kennedy Space Center during the shuttle program, the, the space shuttle orbiters were refurbished on a monthly basis in between flights, but the gigantic external fuel tank, the, the main engines, and the solid rocket boosters were all refurbished elsewhere or built elsewhere. The tanks are built, were built in Louisiana, and the booster rockets were built out in Utah. So a lot of the workforce here was just basically for maintaining the shuttle, and, and nothing was really built here at the Kennedy Space Center. But that's, a, that's, that's changing now. The, the capsule system that will succeed the space shuttle is being built right here at the Kennedy Space Center, at the Operations and Checkup Building, and creating something on the magnitude of 5,000 new jobs here in, uh, on the Space Coast. And a lot, of course, the rocket will be integrated here as well. But the Kennedy Space Center is also transitioning into what they're calling a 21st century launch complex, a complex capable of servicing more than one vehicle at a time, because for the life of the Kennedy Space Center, it only serviced the Apollo Soyuz, uh, the Apollo rocket, and then it only serviced the, the space shuttle. All of the other rockets are launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station. But by redesigning the interior of the gigantic vehicle assembly building, by tearing down the space shuttle launch pads and rendering them clean pads, it's allowing different companies, including some of the companies that launch Cape Side, to look at the Kennedy Space Center as a backup launching site or as a primary launching site. And that ability to, you know, in January launch an Atlas V rocket from launch pad B and turn around two months later and launch a Delta IV rocket, which is completely different, and I won't bore you with why they're different or how. Um, but that ability to turn around and launch something completely different in a relatively short time frame is really going to help us as we push to build a, a more stable presen human presence in space. One of the big transformations, too, at the Kennedy Space Center from the initial construction of pad, uh, of pad B back in the 1960s is after the test flight of the Ares 1X rocket in 2009 and the demolition of the shuttle launch pad out there, they laid completely new fiber optic cables, completely gutted the old 1960s computers that were still out there running all of the pad systems. And in uh, talking with someone the other day, a gigantic room about this size under the pad surface that housed multiple computers which were needed to actually assess the health of, a, of the space shuttle and the Apollo vehicles when they were out at the pad has been replaced with a computer about the size of what you see on your desk at work and at home. One computer. So a lot, even though a lot of stuff doesn't look different at the Kennedy Space Center, there's a lot of underground and hidden work that's being done to modernize the facility. Uh, to really get us ready for not only NASA's next rocket, but that ability to share our assets with commercial companies. Other things that are happening is the Boeing company, um, responsible for planes and a lot of aerospace technology, has rented out one of the shuttle processing facilities at the Kennedy Space Center so they can build and refurbish their commercial crew transportation vehicle called CST-100 right now. So old and new, still operating side by side as we retire Atlantis, Discovery, and Endeavor, right next to them, the next generation of crew transportation vehicles are being built right there at the Kennedy Space Center. But this downtime, too, is also helping us to refocus our efforts um, at the Kennedy Space Center. For, for over 40 years, the launch control process has been very streamlined mainly because in the development stage and in the actual flight stage, we couldn't afford to actually step back and take the time to reassess launching practices and launch commit criteria. unfortunately, unless there was an accident. But looking at how to redesign the firing rooms at the Kennedy Space Center to best serve multiple vehicles, how can we streamline processing of the vehicles? NASA's next generation rocket is theoretically at this stage only going to spend a week at the launch pad between rolling out from the assembly building and launching. The shuttle had to spend a minimum of 22 days at the launch pad before it could be launched because of all the servicing that had to be done to it at the pad. So streamlining that effort, because they're hoping that the Kennedy Space Center will eventually be a multi-rocket facility, is, is really, yeah, that is the next slide, uh, is, is really something that's being looked at right now by NASA management and commercial companies. Now, here's a phrase I've heard a lot since July. Uh, 
but I heard NASA shut down and isn't doing anything anymore. Why are they launching something? Well, that couldn't be further from the truth. <laughs> um, uh, quite appropriately, I think, um, last, this past Saturday, NASA launched the Mars Science Laboratory rover Curiosity on an Atlas V rocket from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station as part of a new Pathfinder mission series to Mars to evaluate the planet's potential habitability for a human presence on the planet. We just four months before that, we launched the Juno probe, which is a new probe on its way to Jupiter at this time to study the Jovian system and the four Jovian moons to see if they support life and if potentially they could be targets for human exploration when we move outside of Mars and decide to expand into the outer reaches of our solar system. The ro and robotic missions are still going on at Mercury, at the moon. We launched uh, in September two little lunar satellites, which will get there in just a couple weeks, I believe. Um, and we have missions, we have multiple missions taking place right now at Mars. There's something on the magnitude of eight functioning spacecraft either orbiting Mars or on the surface of Mars right now. We have the Dawn spacecraft, which is in orbit of an asteroid in the asteroid belt just beyond Mars. And in a couple years, that little uh, satellite will leave orbit of that asteroid and travel to another asteroid in the solar system and orbit it and will become the first man-made object to orbit more than one body in a single mission. We have the Juno probe on its way to Jupiter right now. We have the Cassini mission still in orbit of Saturn. It arrived in 2004 and was expected to last a grand total of six months and is still going and giving us instrumental data on Saturn and its moon Titan and Enceladus. And we have the New Horizons mission, which is currently sailing on its way to Pluto and will arrive on July 4th of 2015. It will be the first man-made spacecraft to, ex to study Pluto and determine once and for all if it is a planet or isn't. Um, <laughs> and very excitingly enough, and something that no one ever expected, 34 years after they were launched from the Cape Canaveral Air Force Station, Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are still functioning and sending back scientific data. They have crossed out of the termination shock of our solar system, which is the area where the sun's solar wind goes from supersonic speed down to subsonic speed. And Voyager 1 has actually passed out of the region where the solar wind is being gradually slowed down and is in the region that we call the heliopause, which is the outermost influence of the sun in the solar system. And beyond that is interstellar space. And um, with some other explora um, exploration that's been going on with satellites in Lagrangian points around Earth and the sun, um, that boundary to interstellar space, we have learned, is much closer than we thought. And sometime within the next six months, Voyager 1 will actually pass out of our solar system and become the first man-made object to exit the solar system. And we'll still be sending back data on what that interstellar medium is actually like and Voyager 2 will follow it out of the solar system a few years later. And the coup de grace for space telescopes right now, I, I, I have to give to uh, the Kepler Space Telescope, which was launched in March of 2009 and is searching, the universe, and then searching our local galactic neighborhood for other Earths and Earth-sized planets and terrestrial planets that lie within the habitable zone of their stars. Um, the habitable zone being defined as the area where if atmospheric conditions are right on the terrestrial planet, liquid water can exist on the surface. And aside from finding hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of gas giants like Jupiter and Saturn, Kepler has also discovered roughly 50 terrestrial planets, uh, three of which lie dead center in the habitable zones of their stars. Um, so research is now going on and a whole slew of telescopes are being pointed at those three planets to figure out their atmospheric characteristics and to take samples of, of their atmospheres to determine if liquid water can actually exist on the surface of those planets and if those planets are habitable or not. And the big thing, which again, all of this gets reported. This does not, for some strange reason. The science that's going on on the International Space Station. For about 15 years, scientists on the ground here on Earth have been struggling with trying to find the genetic code within Salmonella and, the e. and E. coli with what actually is it about those bacteria that make humans sick, violently and sometimes deadly. 
They designed an experiment which was launched to the International Space Station in August of 2009 and was supposed to remain on the station for six months. And their hope was that in the low gravity field around Earth, the genetic bonds around these bacteria would break down enough that we would be actually be able to isolate the genetic markers that make humans sick. This was something that was supposed to take six months. It took three weeks. And they found it for E. coli and for salmonella. And the experiment came back in November of 2009 and is currently in FDA trials for FDA approval um, to start administering to human beings to help us get over and not get sick <laughs> from E. coli and salmonella. And another big one that they did on the International Space Station is a new capsule delivery system for medication. And the capsule is designed to be broken down by intestinal enzymes, not stomach enzymes, so that medication can be delivered to certain points within your intestinal system. So if you have intestinal cancer, medication to treat it can actually be delivered right to the source instead of having to break down and go through the bloodstream. And these are all things that were developed by experiments on the International Space Station and experiments that are still going on. Um, and an ongoing experiment on the International Space Station is experiments into bone loss and bone density loss, which for humans as we get older here on Earth, osteoporosis becomes a concern for all of us. And a lot of the research that's going on for NASA astronauts who spend prolonged times in microgravity and experience that same type of bone degeneration in a very short period of time and treating that and getting them to a recovery stage from that after they get back from a mission is providing us with new ways to treat osteoporosis as well. So NASA is still doing stuff. Don't let anyone tell you they aren't. Another thing that's making the news is, our, is NASA's partnership with commercial companies at this point. Right now, only for uncrewed uh, missions to the International Space Station. The two companies that have our commercial contracts right now are SpaceX, who operates the um, Falcon 9 vehicle and the Dragon spacecraft for, um, for pressurized um, cargo transportation to the International Space Station, and the Orbital Company and their Cygnus spacecraft um, also for pressurized cargo deliveries to the International Space Station. Another thing that has come out very recently um, is NASA's um, desire to man rate a very reliable vehicle, the Atlas V rocket. Um, the Atlas V rocket is 28 for 28 in its mission since 2002. Um, and the one mission that the, that the Atlas V company actually wanted to declare a failure, the payload, com the payload customer actually came back and said, no, no, we're fine, we can get to the orbit we want. So 28 for 28 for the Atlas V rocket. Um, and NASA expressed a desire to actually man rate that vehicle. Um, to, again, open up options, not put all of our eggs in one basket anymore for potential crew transportation to the International Space Station and other points in low Earth orbit. And the contract to begin man rating the Atlas V rocket was awarded in August of this year with an initial comeback date to review the progress in December. And uh, the company actually beat that record and came back in mid-November with all of the information that NASA wanted and the Atlas V got one step closer to actually being man-rated to carry our astronauts into low Earth orbit. But this is the biggie. This is the successor to the space shuttle. Uh, it has been described as the shuttle and Apollo on steroids. It is slightly taller than the Apollo Saturn V rocket and utilizes um, it, and is what we call uh, the shuttle-derived vehicle. It takes the best and most beneficial technologies from the space shuttle program and the most reliable technologies, such as the twin solid rocket boosters and the main engines from the shuttle, um, to put them on a liquid and solid-fueled rocket to propel our astronauts and cargo into low Earth orbit and beyond low Earth orbit. Um, it has what we call multi-mission capabilities. It can be launched unmanned to launch purely cargo, either to the International Space Station or launch large-scale satellites into orbit. Or you can stick a crew capsule on the top of the Space Launch System rocket, or SLS, as it's called. It doesn't have a name like Apollo, Gemini, or Shuttle, so it's kind of difficult to refer to it just as SLS, but that's what it is. Um, and it really um, takes what we learned from the shuttle program to apply it to a new reliable rocket. Um, and sitting on top of that rocket for crew missions is what we call 
is what used to be called Orion up until February of 2009 and is now a much simpler name called the Multipurpose Crew Exploration Vehicle. Um, but everyone still calls it Orion. Uh, <laughs> we went back to the capsule design. It's no longer a winged spacecraft like the space shuttle was simply because we don't need it to be anymore. Uh, the Orion capsule is designed for crew transportation, not cargo transportation anymore. Um, and the capsule design is more suited for the missions that we want to do beyond low Earth orbit. It also won't have those colorings, by the way. NASA just did that to make it look like Apollo. <laughs> the, but the first question we had to ask ourselves when designing this new rocket and saying, all right, our ultimate goal is Mars. We need to get to Mars. So where do we go first? And the logical answer is the moon. <laughs> we've, we've done permanent habitation in low Earth orbit where our astronauts, if there's a serious medical emergency, can be home within two hours on the Russian Soyuz rocket, well, the next step is going four days away from our planet and learning how to live on another planetary body, which we're going to have to do once we get to Mars. So at first, this was the, this was the goal. Go to the moon first, build a colony, learn how to live there, then move on. Then the moon was dropped from the equation for reasons no one really understood, and now it's back. Um, the initial flight manifest for the SLS rocket calls for two circumlunar missions uh, to begin the program. The first one being unmanned, which will just test the rocket's capability and the crew capsule's capability um, in a deep space, and we call the moon deep space still, uh, deep space environment, and the second one to actually put astronauts on the, on, on the Orion spacecraft and send them to orbit the moon. Um, again, part of a phased approach to get us back to, or to get us to Mars, but also because we have to relearn everything that we learned the first time around for Project Apollo to get us to the moon. No one still involved with NASA astronaut or management-wise was around when the Apollo moon missions took place. So all of that information, all those lessons we learned, we have to learn again to do this properly. And after the moon, and this is where it becomes really cool, and this is where NASA's future and this 21st vision 21st century vision of space exploration really kicks off is after we go to the moon. And it might really only be those two orbital trips around the moon and back to Earth before we set our sights on something a little further out and something a little more intriguing, which is to land humans on an asteroid or near-Earth object. There are thousands of asteroids and near-Earth objects near Earth that we could target. And in many ways, it's the next logical step, moving out in a progressive fashion from Earth and not trying to put all of our eggs in one basket and just go to Mars in one go. We get there by using the Orion crew capsule and service module and a little asteroid lander um, that, will allow the cap that will allow us to have a habitation module on an asteroid, will allow us to do EVA excursions on an asteroid, to help us gain more scientific information, because asteroids are the leftover remnants of the solar system's formation, and could answer our question before any rover on Mars does of, is there life somewhere else in the solar system, aside from right here on Earth? Um, but also, we can learn a great deal from this. Going to an asteroid is not like going to the moon. When our astronauts on Apollo and when our astronauts on SLS and Orion will launch to the moon, you can clearly see it out the front windshield. As, as you're flying toward it. An asteroid, you can. And an asteroid is a lot longer than a four-day trip. And an asteroid is a multi-month trip to get there, to spend a couple weeks to a month there, and then have to come back, which takes even longer. Because in space, it's not like driving from Daytona to here and then just turning around and flying the exact same route back. Earth's in motion while we're flying out to this asteroid. The asteroid's in motion, and a lot of the early assessment data for these missions says if it takes two months to get there and we spend a month there, it's going to take seven months to get back because of how quickly that asteroid is moving and how quickly Earth is moving. So dealing with long duration spaceflight missions to get to our objective, right, and then the even longer haul back from that objective is something we've never done before and something we don't do on the International Space Station. Uh, a return trip from an asteroid taking seven months is longer than any of our crew members spend at one time on the International Space Station. So learning in an even more confined environment than the shuttle was, believe me, that thing is a lot smaller than it looks. Um, and so learning again 
in a more confined environment, in a long duration space environment, how do we operate? Also, how much food do we have to take? How much water do we have to take? Do we design a system where water can be produced on the spacecraft itself? And what do you do if that system shuts down? If that's what you're going with, you know? The shuttle was very fortunate. It produced its own water from its electricity producing fuel cells, but they always carried enough that, hey, if it shuts down and we can't generate water, you just come home. So we had that two days su spare supply of water. Well, if we're talking about you know, uh, an 11-month trip, that whole thing would be packed with water. So a lot of these challenges that we're going to have to think about as we go toward Mars and we go further out from Earth are things that we're going to, um, that we can learn by going to asteroids first and moving beyond <coughs> the moon. And the one that no one really understands. <laughs> um, NASA has great interest in using SLS and the Orion capsule to go to Lagrangian points around Earth and around Moon. Lagrangian points, in, in their simplest definition, there are five of them around every orbiting body. So if we take the Sun and Earth, there are five L points around here, which are defined as gravitationally null areas of space, where the gravitational interactions of Earth and the sun void each other out. And these are very interesting locations because they contain a lot of asteroids and a lot of remnants of Earth's formation that are in a, that are in a lockstep orbit with Earth. Basically, at every single one of these Lagrangian points, it takes 365 and a quarter days to go around the sun, even the one that's closer to the sun than Earth's orbit. So anything that's trapped in this gravitationally null area is going to have the same orbital velocity around the sun and the same orbital speed. So going there, finding remnants of Earth's formation is of key importance to understanding how our own planet evolved, especially as Kepler keeps looking for other Earths. You know, Something obviously went right on this planet for life to evolve and didn't on Mars and Venus, which also lie within the habitable zone of the sun. Here, so learning and finding those four and a half billion year old remnants are of high importance. They also, the L4 and the L5 vantage points also provide a unique angle for viewing the sun and how the sun interacts with Earth. A lot of our sun probes, such as the Solar Dynamics Observatory and SOHO, are located within these Lagrangian points because they can see solar flares that are erupting from the sun and are on a course for Earth and act in many ways as an early warning system for us because one good solar flare and say goodbye to your cell phone for a few days um, as we get all our satellite networks back online. So understanding solar weather too, which is going to be a big part of when we go to Mars, is a key importance in these Lagrangian points, specifically the L4 and the L5 Lagrangian points. Now, uh, because these points exist around two orbiting bodies, there are Lagrangian points in the Earth-Moon system. And like the Sun, there are five of them. And these Lagrangian points are very interesting for a completely different reason. They are places where we can put gas stations in space. Um, you know, first law of rocketry is the more payload you pack on, the more fuel you have to take with you on a mission, the less people you can take with you on a mission, and the less payload and, and equipment you can take with you on a mission. So if we can launch from the Kennedy Space Center with empty propellant tanks within our vehicles that are, will eventually get us to Mars or get us back from Mars and simply hook up to a gas station in space and fill up there, it allows us the opportunity to launch a lot more into orbit and really focus on what do we want to take with us instead of the question we have to always ask ourselves now, what can't we take with us because we have to take fuel. So these Lagrangian points around the Earth and Moon are excellent areas to store these, um, to store these gas stations, as are the Lagrangian points around Earth and the Sun. Because if we, take an, if we launch with enough propellant to get us to Mars, we can hook up to one of these gas stations, get all the propellant that we need to do the burns to get us back to Earth. And that's, again, something we don't have to launch with from here. So these propellant depots are really something that's na that NASA's looking at, um, at deploying throughout the inner solar system to these Lagrangian points within the 2020, 2030 timeframe to help us in our eventual trek to Mars, which is our ultimate goal in the vision for the 21st century for NASA. 
Mars has always been of key interest to NASA. It is the planet that we have sent a vast majority of our robots to, um, both the ones that orbit the planet and the ones that rove around on the surface. And again here, like with everything else that NASA has done, it's a phased approach to get us to Mars. Right? The Mars Exploration Rover Spirit and Opportunity, of which one of them is still running, um, coming up on their eighth anniversary on the red planet, they were supposed to last for 90 days. And they're still going, eight, and one of them is still going eight years later. Um, the, and the Curiosity rover that we just launched are part of a robotic precursor mission to the Red Planet to identify areas where it would be safe, or relatively safe, if you will, for humans to land and build colonies and, and live on the Red Planet. And all of our satellites that we have orbiting Mars, such as the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, which passes over the same point on Mars every two weeks, and conducts constant mapping operations of the planet is helping us understand where some of the subsurface liquid that we know resides on Mars because we see new riverbed channels dug into the surface every few weeks, especially in the polar region. Where is this activity most active? Because obviously we wouldn't want to land there, build a colony, and then be washed away. So, un and understanding Mars's climate. You know, Mars has seasons just like the Earth does. And one of the excellent reasons for wanting to go to Mars um, is it has a very similar rotational period to Earth. Um, it, it takes just over 24 hours for Mars to rotate once. So the days on Mars and the days on Earth are, for all intents and purposes, identical. So not having to retrain your sleep cycle is, is another excellent reason for us wanting to go to Mars. Now, the planning aspect is obviously the most difficult. You know, I, or best estimates for a trip to Mars are 2035, 2037, 2040 at, at, at the earliest for humans to actually get there. And there is some debate within NASA as to how should we go there first? Should we attempt to actually land on the planet or should we attempt to land on one of Mars's moons, mainly Phobos? Um, if, and a benefit to landing on Phobos is you don't have to deal with a planetary atmosphere, which is very, very dangerous, which we've learned sadly here in our own human spaceflight program, but in a lot of the missions that have been sent to Mars have failed somewhere in the atmospheric entry sequence. So learning how to get to Mars and then landing on a place where you don't have to deal with the dangers of an atmosphere certainly makes sense, you know, with the eventual goal to actually land on the planet. But the biggest thing with this is that, and, and everyone is sort of in agreement with this, is when the human race decides to go to Mars, we're going to go as a human race. It's not going to be the United States and everyone else can, can deal with it. You know, the, the, the sheer amount of infrastructure and knowledge that we will have to stockpile and build on orbit, everything that we will have to send to Mars and to the landing place that we eventually choose, which is going to have to be chosen years, if not decades in advance, is going to have to be stockpiled there. We don't have the ability to launch the habitation module and the spacecraft and the food and the propellant that we're going to need once we get to our habitation module on Mars, all of that is going to have to be launched years before the human mission actually leaves the planet. And because the launch windows to Mars only last for about four to six weeks every two years, this is going to require an unprecedented international undertaking. Require, you know, with the launch facilities that we have here in Florida, the launch facilities in South America for the European Space Agency, Japan's uh, launching facilities, and Russia's launching facilities. And it's really going to be, have to be an internationally coordinated effort to get there, which will most likely translate into an international crew going to Mars and not just being one particular nation. Which, again, draws on the experience of all of the world's spaceflight industries that we have. Um, you know, Russia has certainly had a great deal of experience in human spaceflight. Russia has been the country doing the Mars 500 experiments where they take four or five people and lock them in a, a spacecraft for 500 days to see how they would react to the time it would take to get to Mars and get back. Um, and again, these are all things that we're doing here on the ground right now for something that is at best 30 years away from, from where we are now. And all of that knowledge is going to have to come together. And what we're doing right now on the International Space Station is a great way to really solidify those bonds that we're forming with other nations in the space flight arena. Now, of course, there's a bigger question of when we get there, what do we do? 
Um, and a lot of you know, and a lot of the critics are saying, you know, like, well, if you're going to send humans there to dig down into the soil and analyze soil samples, well, that's what the Curiosity rover is going to do. That's what Spirit and Opportunity have done. That's what Pathfinder has done and Viking One has done. So, what's different about this? But in many ways, people said the same thing about the moon. <laughs> people have had said the same thing about sailing the oceans. You know, you know, why do people still sail around the ocean? by themselves today. It's been done before, but it's that drive of exploration within the human spirit. And, you know, for everything that our robots have done, you know, and, and everything that they can do to us, there are still things that only humans can do. You know, we're proving that right now on the International Space Station. As much as we would love to eliminate the risk of sending someone outside of the station to do a spacewalk, which is very, very risky for the astronaut doing it, Robots don't have fingers. Robots don't have thumbs. You know, robots can't intuitively, you know, change a program like a human can. You know, and one of the great successes of the space station assembly sequence and the amount of spacewalks it took was the ability of our astronauts to improvise once they got up there. And if something didn't quite work, to know, well, oh, I can root it behind the handrail instead of over it. A robot would have to be programmed to do that. So. And, and maintenance of spacecraft to get us there are, are still things that only humans can do. So what do we do when we get there? That's a question that really hasn't been answered yet. It's, it's a question that we're considering. Certainly that goal of exploration, that goal of establishing a permanent human settlement on another world and throughout the inner solar system is something that is, you know, is something that people are thinking about right now um, and something that we're beginning to take a very serious look at. You know, a lot of people have sort of said in a tongue-in-cheek manner, if the human race is going to survive, we need to you know, spread out to a few planets in, in order to do it, to ensure our own survival eventually. And you know, a lot of them mean it in a very tongue-in-cheek manner, but when you think about it, the more we expand, the more we can learn about what happened on Mars that, that caused Mars to fail as, as a planet capable, or that we think is incapable of supporting life. What caused that planet to fail? If we can understand that and at the same time gain a better understanding of our own planet here, there are things that we can do you know, to, to really help ourselves out and things that we can learn you know, as a species and how we react to different things by going to Mars. Um, but once we get there, we've got to come back some way. And, and this is very much what NASA is looking at now. That ability to come directly back is something that doesn't exist because of the way the planets line up. It's very easy to get to Mars in a straight shot where it takes seven to nine months. You know, the Curiosity rover we launched on Saturday will arrive at Mars on August 3rd of 2012, a nine-month trip, which in terms of going to Mars is actually quite long. Um, m most of the probes that we've sent have taken seven months to get there because of planetary alignments. But NASA is really considering, you know, what's the most efficient way to get our astronauts back? And what we're realizing is that if it takes us seven to nine months to get there, and then we have to stay there until the planets align again, we're talking about staying for a year and a half you know, at Mars if we actually land on the surface of the planet. And when it's time to come back, we don't have that same direct capability. And what NASA is really looking at is a return trip that takes us closer to the sun than Venus actually orbits the sun, Venus being the second <coughs> planet from our sun. And you know, that opens up a whole host of, of new worries of getting that close to the sun what if there's a solar flare? How do we deal with radiation in space? How do we protect our crew from all of the things necessary to come back home? You know? And of course, when you, when you send something out into the void of space, you kind of want to make sure it doesn't hit something <laughs> out there. You know? And you know, one of the things we're learning you know, as, as more and more telescopes scan the night sky and, and scan the space around Earth, is that there are thousands and thousands of little tiny rocky objects within the inner solar system um, that, that pose severe and significant hazards to space vehicles. Um, very fortunately, none of them have hit, uh, you know, none of our space vehicles have hit any of these objects, but our map of the inner solar system is very incomplete. It's, it's not just the planets, it's everything else that's in there in the void between the planets. And these are all things that have to be taken into account and a lot of the technologies that NASA is working on in terms of how to protect our astronauts when, when they go to come back to Earth. And that, in a nutshell, 
is NASA's vision for the next 30 to 40 years. So it is open to questions now. Yes? The uh, Orion capsule reusable? I heard it's like 10 times or something. The Orion capsule will be reusable. Um, it will be reusable up to 10 times. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> yes, sir? Is beer still flying? Is beer still? Mir. Oh, Mir. Oh. <laughs> Oh, well, boy, there's an insight into where my mind is right now. Yeah. Uh, no, Mir re-entered the atmosphere in 1999. Yes. It, it was purposefully um, demanded and deorbited after permanent settlement on the International Space Station was planned. Yes? Uh, yeah, um, a lot of, well, like I mentioned, the osteoporosis and bone degeneration research. Um, we're also doing a lot of research on, on the human side of things right now in terms of what's the best diet for astronauts in a low gravity environment. How can we use equipment like ultrasound technology to diagnose um, potential ailments in space? Um, and ultrasound to, uh, one, one of the things they did on the space station uh, a couple years ago was look to see if the ultra, if ultrasound machines could give a good indication of the bone loss and the bone density loss that was occurring within astronauts on, on a daily basis. Um, there's a vast majority of Earth science missions. Um, there is the, uh, what's referred to as the premier experiment for the International Space Station, the Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer, which was launched on the second to last shuttle mission and is a permanent fixture on the outside of the International Space Station that is searching the universe for evidence of dark matter, antimatter, and dark energy, um, trying to unlock those mysteries. And one of the interesting things is uh, it was launched in May aboard the shuttle Endeavour, and in July, some of the first findings from that experiment were released that suggest that there's actually a thin band of antimatter that surrounds the Earth, um, and that's in orbit of Earth. Uh, what that means, anyone's guess. Um, but a lot of external experiments, there are permanent ones on the European Columbus Lab that look down at Earth's oceans and ocean current patterns and ocean pollution um, and how the ideas of climate change are reflected within Earth's oceans right now. Um, the station does science 24-7. Um, and for those of you who are interested, there is an app for that now. Um, called ISS Live, believe it or not, and you can um, interact uh, with and see some of the scientific experiments that are going on within the U.S. Destiny Lab on the station um, on a daily basis and what those results are as they're beamed back to Earth. Yes, sir. Is there any talk about um, different approaches to the Mars mission, as in um, they ne them never coming back? I mean, because then you wouldn't have to worry about a return vehicle. You mean eventual, eventual permanent no, 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 habitation? The first mission, because we have to consider the option that the first mission they may never come back. Okay, so I'm, I mean, I, I, I'm going to ask for clarification on that. You mean planning that they will never come yeah, back? Planning that they will never come back, because then you won't need return fuel, you don't need a return vehicle, you don't need to think about leaving the surface, stuff like that. Um, in terms of actually planning a mission where the crew does not come back, no. Yeah. Um, they're, they're not planning that. Um, I mean, eventually the goal is permanent habitation on Mars, and you know, eventually someone will volunteer to live out the rest of their life on Mars. Um, but for the initial stages of the mission, no. Um, there are um, discussions taking place, because very fortunately, um, we've never actually lost a crew in orbit. You know, we've lost, we've lost crew in, in launch mishaps and reentry mishaps here on Earth, but we've never actually lost someone in space during the mission. Um, and that eventuality that someone may, through natural causes, die either on the way to or on the way back from a long duration space flight is, is something that NASA is beginning to consider rather severely when we're talking about year long voyages from our planet. Um, I, I, you know, the optimist in me says we'll get to the point where it'll be one-way missions to Mars and not because you die, but because you actually want to set up residence on Mars. The optimist in me says that'll happen someday. I, I, I think that's a very, very long way off, though. Um, yeah. Yes? What did the, the, the Columbia Spectrum have on the retirement of the space shuttle? Uh, it had everything to do with the retirement of the space shuttle. 
um, the Columbia accident was the precipitating factor for retiring the shuttle after the completion of assembly of the International Space Station. Um, there were a lot of interesting shuttle missions planned that never happened. Um, there was one uh, that was planned, it was actually planned to use Columbia because Columbia was, um, being the first operational shuttle was too heavy to fly significant missions to the International Space Station. So Columbia was going to be used primarily for satellite repair missions, specifically to the Hubble um, for her final two flights. Um, and the final flight of Columbia was actually supposed to be a mission that brought back the Hubble Space Telescope to Earth for display in the Smithsonian. Um, but after, um, after the Columbia was lost, um, you know, the shuttle was looked at as sort of this black spot within NASA um, and was in, in many ways unfairly categorized as an inherently unsafe vehicle. Um, which, which I would argue, you know, certainly in the missions in between Challenger and Columbia and certainly after Columbia, we, we proved that with enough respect for the system, you know, we could fly those vehicles very safely. Um, but because of that sort of stain on the program, that was the precipitating factor for retirement. Um, to sort of put it in perspective, each of the shuttle orbiters were built to fly 100 missions each. Um, Discovery flew 39, Atlantis flew 33, Columbia 28, Endeavor 25, and Challenger 10. Um, and of the three that survived to the end of the program, you know, Discovery flying 39 out of 100, and Endeavor flying 25 out of 100 sort of puts it into perspective of, you know, how much more life those vehicles potentially had in them. Yes? Why is there so much space to jump? Is it mostly from the early years when people thought there was yeah, a, a lot of it. Is there anything we didn't have to clean it up? Yeah, uh, that's a, that's an excellent question. Um, a lot of a lot of the space debris that we have are either from um, spent rocket casings. Um, a lot of the upper stages for rockets, you know, that propel the satellites into their eventual orbits, are traveling at orbital velocity with the satellite itself. So they're not on a natural, excuse me, decayed return into Earth's atmosphere. Um, a lot of it too has, has come in recent years. Um, there, there's, a, there's a report that was issued that um, a, a couple years ago when China launched a missile to purposefully destroy one of its weather satellites, or, or weather satellites if you will, um, created about 10,000 little tiny pieces of space junk just from that one thing and accounts for roughly a fifth of the space junk debris that's up there now, that um, that? that's in low Earth orbit. Yeah, low Earth orbit defined as the area of space where the shuttles operated and where the International Space Station operates. Um, in since the beginning of the 1990s, those upper stages of the rockets have been designed purposely with chemical engines and chemical rockets, so that after they deploy their payload, those engines are fired to drop them into suborbital speeds, so they enter the atmosphere right away. Um, so we're, we're taking note of that and we're trying. Um, unfortunately, that, you know, trying to pick up tens of thousands of pieces of space junk that are flying at different orbits and different trajectories and at different altitudes is a, an impossible task. Um, we're trying very actively not to add to it, um, but unfortunately it's something that's just going to have to decay naturally at this point. So there's a gradual erosion. There is, yes, there is a gradual erosion, um, but it takes, it takes years. Is there much danger in, in this? Um, problems? Yeah, um, it, it, it very well could. Um, the, the risk assessment for um, the, the final 15 space shuttle flights listed the risk of a catastrophic failure for the shuttle system due to a orbital debris impact at roughly 1 in 700. Um, of a chance. Now when you multiply that out by the amount of space junk that there is up there, that's a rather significant and scary number and it was actually the third greatest uh, risk for flying the space shuttle. Um, mainly because of the damage it could do to the thermal protection system. Not that it would puncture the crew cabin, just that it could do irreparable damage to the thermal protection system at a certain point. Uh, which is something that the Orion Crew Exploration Vehicle takes into account. Its heat shield for the entire duration of its mission is protected by the service module that's attached to the end of it. So the heat shield um, that will allow Orion to enter the atmosphere safely 
will be protected throughout its mission and only exposed to space for a few minutes before the vehicle actually hits the atmosphere, and, and we need it. Um, but it, it's, it's a pretty serious risk. Um, the International Space Station has, does what they call uh, debris avoidance maneuvers, DAMS, um, and uh, the shuttle would do collision avoidance maneuvers um, to avoid some of this debris. Um, there are significantly large chunks of it that, that we can track from ground-based radars and we know exactly the trajectory it's on and where it will be, so we know if it's going to be a danger to the International Space Station and can avoid it. What we run into issues with are the smaller ones that are about half the size of a thumbnail um, that, that we can see, but because they're so small we can't get a good bearing on where exactly it's going to be in its orbital path. And you know, when we can't determine that, we don't want to move the space station you know, and potentially put it into the path of that object. So we have what's called a safe haven protocol aboard the International Space Station where the, the six or three member station crew will get into the Russian Soyuz rocket. They'll close all the hatches between the different modules on the station so that if a module takes an impact and is breached, you don't lose the entire station. Um, but in the event that something does happen, the crew is protected within the Soyuz entry vehicles and can simply undock from the station if the station were actually ever to take a direct hit and come home and be safe. Um, so it, it, it is something that we live with. Um, and again, like, like I was talking about, about you know, creating a more stable map of the inner solar system when we're talking about return trips from Mars and, and asteroids because you don't want you know, a little tiny piece of rock hitting your spacecraft as you're flying through you know, the void of space. You know, equally important is understanding that, that man-made debris field around Earth because when you're coming back from a lunar mission and you're coming back from a Mars or a near-Earth asteroid mission, you don't have the luxury of waving off like the shuttle did, you know, where the shuttle, if, if a weather situation wasn't perfect, could just stay on orbit for another day. You're on a ballistic return trajectory and you're coming back whether you want to or not. So really understanding where those, that debris field and where the pieces of debris are gonna be so you can plot a safe path for the vehicle as it's coming home is, is something that we have to get better at. Um, and, and something that luckily because of the Luckily, because of the time frame to protect our astronauts, infuriating for those of us who want the system to be online right now, um, with you know, the decade that it's going to be before we actually launch another manned mission on a NASA rocket, we have a lot of time to think about this and put technology in place and radar detectors in place to really map that field and get a good indication of, of what it's actually like in the various levels. Yes? Yes, that, that would be the other fifth <laughs> um, uh, of it. Uh, you know, uh, periodically too, you know, how cluttered, you know, we, it's kind of hard to think of space being so vast but being cluttered at the same time, but you know, we have had defunct satellites which are non-operational anymore and we have no control over that collide, you know, with one another. And you know, when you've got two, two objects going at 17,500 miles an hour, to put that into, you know, f you know, 25 times faster than the speed of sound, you know, um, and, and they collide with one another. There's nothing left of them except for little fragments and shards of debris, which then add to that debris field. Was uh, that, in low Earth orbit? that was in low Earth orbit. It sure was. It was, thankfully enough, just slightly below the orbit of the International Space Station. Um, but then, of course, because like what we had to do is shuttle in all of our resupply vehicles that launch up to shuttle have to pass through this area where that debris cloud could be, you know. And over the years of time, when that debris cloud expands out, it's no longer confined to a little narrow orbital corridor. You know, it's it's this really wide thing that you have to fly through sometimes to to get to station. Will that, will that re -enter it will eventually re-enter. Much of it, most likely, already has, um, uh, as well as much of the debris from the Chinese satellite has already re-entered. Um, but the stuff that got flung out into even higher orbits when the when the satellites collided and when the missile hit that Chinese satellite, you know. Is are the things we still have to deal with? You know. Well, you know lots, and uh, some people would want to stay and ask for some. I, I know plenty more. Place. I could have bored you for days. <laughs> well, that's my job. Oh. <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Stetson University.